Hello, everyone. I'm Sylvia Lee, and I want to welcome you to the Diatom Web Academy, brought to you by the Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee of the Society for Freshwater Science and diatoms.org. Um, check out our news page on diatoms.org for the schedule of webinar speakers. And follow Diatoms of North America on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook for updates. If you prefer to get your updates by email, I have an important piece of news for you. Due to new Google security requirements, I transferred the email list to a Google group. And so you should have received a couple emails from diatom-web-academy at googlegroups.com. If not, check your spam folder and save that Google group in your email contacts and please mark it as not spam. Again, that email address is diatom-web-academy at googlegroups.com. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mark to introduce today's speaker. Uh, th thanks, Sylvia. We are going to take our, I think, our first voyage into the marine realm today. I don't think we've had a, 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 a marine diatomist speak to our, our Diatom Web Academy yet. So it's my pleasure today to, inter, er, to welcome and introduce um, Tom Frankovich, who is, comes to us from uh, Florida International University, where he's been a, a research assistant professor there, um, working on Everglades issues, working on nearshore issues, and working on this amazing stuff on the evolution and ecology of, of diatoms that grow on marine megafauna. Uh, Tom got his PhD at University of Virginia back in 2006. He's been at Florida International since then. Um, and really, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to have you speak to us today. Um, Tom is probably most famous for um, being on the 2017 Scum Run winning team at the <laughs> at the uh, at the NADS meeting, in which I was also on that team, the uh, team Graybeards. So, <clears throat> <laughs> not named after the pirates, but named after um, us. So, thanks, Tom, and uh, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, well, I am I am super excited about be, being here today, and uh, you know, I want I, I want to thank you and Sarah and Sylvia for putting this together. It's great. I, I found out uh, about this um, you know webinar series, the the academy, a little late in 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 COVID. But once I found out, I binge watched it. You know? <laughs> and I, wow, it was great. I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, we're gonna have a lot of fun today. Um, and I guess normally the you know, you th think about these uh, these academy webinars as ways to train and introduce the uh, viewers to taxa that they may see in their work, and to you know um, encourage you know uh, uh, cross calibration. Well, you know, the stuff I'm going to show you today is not going to be very useful for that. I can probably uh, safely guess that uh, probably. Most of you will probably never see these in, in any of your accounts. These uh, uh, diatoms and, and the communities on, uh, that are on these animals are unique and so far found only on them. So they, they appear to be uh, exclusively epizoic communities. So as I mentioned in, I'm having a little problem uh, advancing. <laughs> Oh, sorry. There it goes. I got to be patient. Pardon me. I think I've seen it yesterday. So, um, as I mentioned in the um, in the abstract, uh, you know, this um, I'm going to I'm going to describe an odyssey that started in 2013, and um, you know, much you know, much like Homer's Odyssey, it's it's going to take us to vastly different areas uh, throughout you know throughout you know seven eight years. Uh, but different, it, it's going to, instead of being going to different landmass islands, we're going to go to islands that are the animal, the uh, bodies of these animals are the, um, are the, are the islands. So I was saying, alluding to that this started out, this whole investigation started out with a simple phone call from a veterinarian friend of mine in, in 2013. And she is pictured at the top of this spaghetti flow chart here. Uh, yeah, this is Nicole Stacy, and she is a, uh, a cytologist, pathologist, and she looks at uh, skin smears, blood samples, uh, fluid samples from a whole bunch of aquatic, large, you know, large aquatic animals, 
And she told me that, that uh, they had a problem. And the problem they had is that uh, they would, uh, um, the pathologist would also often misidentify um, harmful parasites or sorry, I, I misidentified diatoms and then identify them as possible harmful parasite eggs. So she asked, she said, hey, can you look at the, I send you a bunch of pictures over the next few weeks, can you identify the diatoms in them? And at that time I told her, oh yeah, sure, no problem, That's, that'll be a piece of cake. And you know, and back then I, for the first time I put, put my foot in my mouth, but you'll see it's not the, won't be the first time. I told her, I said, yes, you know, and on top of that, I'll, I'll be able to identify the species of those things because the stuff that, that's on these animals is going to be the same that's found on the, in the benthos of, of this, you know, South Florida environment. And, you know, I thought I had a pretty good handle of, of what's in that South Florida environment. So from that simple phone call, you can see from this uh, spaghetti chart here, it expanded to a bunch of different animals, uh, probably 20 different collaborators, um, uh, a lot of them being, you know, some of the uh, veterinary animal people, and then brought us to, you know, I think four different, four different continents. So we're going to describe some of that journey today. You know, you may recognize some of the pictures on here, some uh, of our fellow diatomists, you know, Mike Sullivan up there, if you can see my cursor, I believe you can, Matt Ashworth. Uh, this is um, uh, Roxana Majeska, Bart Van de Viver, Sancitza Bosak. And, uh, and, and down here is, um, boy, <laughs> uh, the, the, and, and Josh Stepanek, yeah. And then also I know joining us today is, uh, is Jesse Huggins down here working on that gray whale. Just waiting for the slide to advance. All right. So, as I said, you know, this, this is the problem that, that Nicole said. He said that um, pathologists were confusing um, harmless diatoms with potentially harmful parasite eggs. And this here is actually a, a, a photograph that uh, she sent to me from one of the veterinary journals. And in red is the caption underneath that journal. It says, egg subjective of protozoan origin. Well, if you take a close look at it, you can, I know you can actually, if you're a marine guy, you can actually recognize that as uh, actually the species, Mastoboloia binatata. And it's within a, a big mus a mucilage bubble here. These are the, uh, the plastids. Uh, there's a storos here. Um, so yeah, you know, it's a real problem. Okay. So these are the kind of um, images that, that she had sent me. She, she's got, you know, skin smears, blood smears. This one happens to be teeth fluid. And, and they're stained with a, the nuclear stain, this right jamsima stain, given this purple color. And here, we, here there's a diatom right in the middle of it. And you can see that's the nucleus that's uh, that, that stained in the middle. And you know, guys, you can see, look, that, 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 that diatom there has got a pretty, pretty wide cingulum. You know, it's a, it's a pretty good sized diatom, maybe 30, 30 40 microns. Uh, but you know, you really can't tell too much from these, you know, low resolution images. Again, they're just, uh, they're just, you know, smears, you know, put on, put on a slide. Okay. So I asked her at the time, I said, Hey, you know, do you have any raw material that, that, that I can look at, you know, and, you know, get a little better look just because I'm interested. And she said, nah, I'm, you know, this is, this is all I get, you know, that they, they, um, they take those uh, smears in the field and they send me the slides and then I, I send you the pictures. So um, I said, you know, for some reason, some, somebody was looking out for me. My sort of prayers were answered only about a few weeks later. So I was sitting here, right here in the same office I'm at right now. And uh, I have a knock on my door. And here at the field station, there's a bunch of law enforcement rangers and a law, uh, one of the rangers come in and he said, hey, Tom, uh, can I spare you this morning? You know, can, can you go with me out, out into the building? There's a, there's a dead manatee that, that, that's clogging up one of the canal, or one of the cuts. Can you help me move it out of the way? And I think, you know, dead rotten manatee, most people would have said, you know, ah, I'm sorry, I got, I, I, got, I got other stuff I need to do. But I said, heck yeah, hold on a minute. You know, let me grab my toothbrush. I'll be right with you. 
So this is a photograph of, you know, this, this one's long dead. The skin is off of it. This is all feces from the vultures. But uh, this here is a piece of the skin uh, from, that, from that first manatee that I sampled from Florida Bay. So I, could, I brought that back. I could stick it in acid, you know, get the diatoms off it and, uh, you know, prepare a, you know, standard diatom slide. So, yeah, cool. And wow, you know, once I, once I made that up, was I in for a surprise? Um, one thing I've, that I first noticed was, wow, one, there's a lot of diatoms on this. There's, there's a lot, you know, and, and looking at the skin, you know, it just looks like a regular piece of skin with maybe some dust on it, but it, it was, it was loaded. Um, the, the, the composition, there was a very, very low diversity. It, it appeared to be, you know, maybe two or three different forms, different taxa on there. And that was about 90% of what was on there. There was a, there was another, there was a cochineus in there too. And then I, you know, I, I looked at, looked at these on the, on the microscope slide and, you know, I, I couldn't even identify it to, to, to even a genus. So I was a little embarrassed. And, uh, you know, at that point I, I, um, I emailed Mike Sullivan, I, you know, Mike was the uh, editor of Diatom Research for 20, 20 years, maybe. And I said, Mike, I said, I'm a little embarrassed. I thought I knew my diatoms and I got, I got something that's super abundant and I can't even identify the genus. And, you know, and I got, I got a hundred books on the shelf. I've got a whole, uh, two whole file cabinets, just the benthic, you know, diatom taxonomy and I'm clueless. So I sent him the pictures, some of the pictures like, like you see over here on the right. And he actually came back pretty quickly, uh, in fact, the same day, and he was laughing. He said, well, I'm not surprised you didn't find it in any of your literature, because what you have there appears to be one of the, some of the whale diatoms. Yeah, and he said, yeah, it's, you know, just, you know, a handful of, handful of papers describing this unique diatom flora that, you know, at this point have only been found on whales. But he said, yeah, I think that's, I think that's what you got. So, you know, and it was a relatively recent literature right let's say you know post 1950s 60s so you you had SEMs it only consisted at that time of you know three or four species so right away uh you could quickly determine you know hey we had you know we got three new species here and they were belong to this genus known as Terciacola and the um the synapomorphy for Terciacola is the structure called the butterfly structure this is something which comes off of the the valve edge and then merges down with the central nodule creating this roofed chamber here. So, and this, you know, sort of becomes one with the, there are pseudo septa um, up at, you know, up at the apicea, apicea of these valves. And this, this, you can see the evidence of the pseudo septa right here in this, uh, in this girdle view image of Barry Copulifera. All right, so you said, you know, whale diatoms, you know, what were they? The whale diatoms were these three, ter Tercicola olympica, Tercicola omure and Tercicola storo lineata. Uh, originally first described by Houston, who uh, first assigned them to the genus, or first assigned Olympica to the genus Storoneus. Okay. And over here, this is actually a picture of some of the diatom colonies on orchids uh, from Antarctica. I don't know what, uh, what these colonies are, but this, that's a really good healthy population of, uh, of, of diatoms on the, on the skin. And that's not, that's not always the case. So at that point, I said, well, that's great. You know, okay, we got, uh, we got, three, we got three new species in these things. And we went ahead to, uh, you know, work with the morphology and, and, and describe what the, you know, what they look like and describe, describe the new species. But also we said, hey, you know, it'd be really nice if we could actually get, you know, Get, a, get some live samples, also sample something more than just one single manatee, uh, you know, see what else is on there. Uh, so um, we had an opportunity to sample some live manatees during some manatee health assessments. So this picture here shows a, this manatee's not hurt. Uh, he or she is just in for her annual checkup and the veterinarians are gonna take blood, weigh her, weigh him or her, and just give her a, give her a good health checkout. So I get opportunity to, you know, again, you know, sample live diatoms. The main thing I wanted to do, I wanted to describe the chloroplastids, chloroplasts, and I wanted to get these guys in the culture and, and grow these. So what happened? Well, we had failure. Our two main objectives, we, we struck out. 
we did we were unable to describe the chloroplast and the tersey coli species the species did not survive in culture well we had a really good for these failures and i'll show you oh thank you okay the reason we failed because these tersia cola on these manatees were apochlorotic. They were heterotrophic. And wow, that was a you know, huge surprise, of course, right? Because there's only like um, maybe 10, 10 species out of 22,000 species of diatoms that are known to be um, obligately heterotrophic without, without, uh, without chlorophyll. Uh, and those are, uh, they belong to a genus Anitsia and Hansia. And here we've got, you know, totally unrelated genus with at least four, at least four species there, you know, completely without chlorophyll. Here's a picture of them. Um, whatever glades these, these, uh, these are oil globules inside them. And these guys are pretty modal, but they're pretty quickly. In fact, when I got this picture here, all three of them got together and stopped. So I got a, I got a quick photograph and focus. Uh, another photograph show you a little bit more. Uh, this is the very copulifera here on the right, bottom right. Uh, there's a cytoplasmic bridge. And if you remember from some of um, Nicole's images with the, with the right gems and a stain, there's a nucleus right here, right in the middle of that cytoplasmic bridge. Okay, so yeah, so cool. Um, Matt Ashworth, uh, was actually able to extract DNA from single cells because it said the cultures, we couldn't culture them, but he, ex he extracted them from single cells and vouchered, you know, photo vouchered those single cells. And we actually produce a phylogeny based on the 18S, our DNA gene. And we show, show sure enough, you know, that this tertiary cola is well far removed from Nitzia. So this uh, is evidence of a second evolutionary loss of photosynthesis, so pretty significant. Uh, lot still awaits there, you know. Did they did, did they lose the same genes? Did they retain the same genes as as, uh, as, as the as those lost with Nitsi and Hansi, the apochlorotic ones? Uh, yeah, those, those all await future discovery. Oh, and by the way, we also we also uh, discovered three additional new tertiary cola from those new samples. So we had uh, six uh, new species from the genus. And that just about doubled the original count in the genus from whales. Um, and another thing, this we noticed, you know, one of them had a really strange morphology. This here, uh, Tersi cola alata. And I, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and, and uh, show you a little bit more, more uh, detailed images of that. Um, we think about these isolated epizoic habitats that may be conducive for diatoms to experiment with unique morphologies. You know, so, you know, such as, you know, on, on some of these islands where you have some strange things going on, you have flightless birds, you may have some, uh, you know, strange, uh, strange animals with unique ornamentation that, you know, may, may, may not, that may not uh, exist in, a, in, a, in an environment where there's, you know, much greater amount of species with greater competition and maybe greater predation. So maybe, you know, maybe if we have a unique environment where we may have some unique morphologies developing. Again, this is just speculation, hypothesis, but, look, but let's take a look at the, a couple, uh, couple of strange ones. So this, this uh, Tersia cola alata here, I said is really strange. Um, before I show you, before we had it on the SEM, you know, we saw it, saw it in girdle view and looked like this, you know, so we, called it the hamburger diatom because it looks like a hamburger. You know, they're like, what the heck is this? You know, what the heck are these things that extending from the, from the top of the valve? And this was, you know, before we had the SEM. So here are some uh, uh, live images of, of those cells. And this is, again, what they look like. And here's a pictures of the wings. And, you know, again, you know, what the heck is that? You know, I, I haven't seen anything like that in a wraith of diatom. So we were really excited to get these uh, specimens under SEM. And then when we got them there, we said, wow, you know, wow, this is really cool. So these things are, are elevated, you know, silica ridges that, you know, uh, that emerge right at the valve face mantle junction. They come up pretty high. They, they, they you know, obscure the uh, wraith. I mean, you know, why would you do that? And then, you know, so we, we got lucky. We actually got one to sit on top of the wings, you know, and get a valve view, which is 
very difficult. I mean, that took that took a lot of searching to, to find that, uh, so we could actually see what this what the uh, central rape ends look like. So, cool. Another one, uh, Tersicola castata. This was uh, actually from the first set of samples. This one has these elevated uh, transapical costi in in between the strides, and they're. That you see, they, see, they come off the top, uh, uh, come off the bow face a pretty good amount. You, and you could actually look at these in the, in the light microscope, and, and you can see they look kind of fuzzy. And then you look at this, and then you go, "Wow, what the heck is that?" And you know, Mike's son or Mike's grandson, he's, he he uh, saw saw some pictures, and he called them the uh, you know Sharknado fins. So again, you know, you know some strange morphology. All right, and it's going to shift gears a little bit. So you know, when we were doing that, you know, it came to the point where we had to describe the habitat that these guys were in. So we have the skin. What else is on the skin? Uh, what else is on the skin? There, there's a, there, oftentimes there's a large felt of macroalgae on them. And it's a red macroalgae. And we decided to take an attempt at, you know, identifying what, what that is. And, you know, I could see that it was, you know, a polysophonia or polysophonia, you know, type. And I, I called in Wilson Freshwater. I said, Wilson, we got some, I got something new here. I don't think this is any one, any one of the existing polysophonias. And he took DNA before he even examined the morphology and said, yeah, this is, this is unique. Uh, let's, you know, look, let's look at some dried samples. And I won't go into, into too much detail here, but, but I, what I want to say is that this macroalgae also had some unique morphology adaptations not seen before. So, you know, polysophonia, this... Uh, filament this uh, red algae uh, attaches either by a hold fast, a little disc, or a prostrate network of, um, of, um, of, of, of like, uh, of, of roots, right? But this guy, instead of having a prostrate, now this one had a vertical, vertical stuff that we believe was uniquely adapted to go through the skin and actually adhere to the very basal bottom layers of the skin. And the, and the reason we believe that is because this, the skin is shed. So if, if it only attached as a hold fast or as a, um, a, a spreading network of these rhizoids, pardon me, rhizoids, I should, I should say, not roots, rhizoids, and um, th then, then it would be lost. So this thing seems to have, have evolved a, a, a special, you know, special adaptation, special structure. And, you know, we can th only think that, you know, maybe something similar to that is also happening with the diatoms. And also I bring this, I brought this here because I think it's, uh, I think it's real amusing to see an, a big animal on the, on, the cur on the cover of Journal of Phycology. I figure, uh, you know, a bunch of phycophiles were maybe not too happy with that. And you know, maybe Gilbert Smith is rolling in his grave <laughs> seeing that happen, but it's quite amusing. All right, so at the same time that we were looking at these um, uh, manatees, Nicole was also sending pictures from sea turtles and we were noticing the, the, same, the, the same group of uh, diatoms in them. Not exactly the same species, but again, we're seeing these Tersiacola and also this other one that we would conveniently refer to them as marine gomphonemoids because they look like gomphonema with uh, they attach by a stalk, um, they're, um, they're, they're, they're cuneate, Often heteropolar, uh, but you know, as I don't know if I'll get around to showing it today, but but they're not related in any way to to gomphonema. Uh, they're actually close uh, uh, closer to the to the tertia cola, but 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 still distant. You, um, not you know not not that close. And these are these are two of the ones that we found specifically on the skin of loggerhead turtles, uh, as opposed to the carapace. And again, I was mostly looking at the skin at first because. That's what I was first exposed to with the manatees. So I said, well, let's look at the skin. And I did look at the, the carapace. The carapace was a whole lot of the you know, regular benthic taxa. So I thought. But here, this, this shows you one Tersi Cola Denisii. This guy, we actually, uh, after, uh, we, after we sampled it, we actually uh, observed it alive. It has chloroplasts. It's photosynthetic. It, it survived in culture. We actually got DNA from it. Uh, and this one, Medlinella amphroidea. Um, Found this in Europe and also also down here in the uh, in South Florida and the Caribbean. Uh, haven't got DNA from it, but actually we've got we just did a big try just a couple of weeks ago, so maybe in a few weeks. Um, 
unbeknownst to me at the time in 2015, when we, 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 uh, we published some of that stuff, we found out that Roxana Majeska was also looking at uh, episode of diatoms on sea turtles. And she described uh, two new genera, Kalinocola and Pulinia. These are some pictures of, of, of those taxa. And these, uh, she described those from olive ridley turtles. But since then they've been found on most all sea turtles, but except maybe the leatherback, but, but, I'm, but I'm, not, I'm not sure on that. The leatherback definitely had a bunch of unique taxa. And also, uh, Catherine Rio Goban was also looking at uh, turtles and also found a bunch of unique uh, taxa that, that appeared to be exclusively epizoic. Another uh, Kilonicola and this uh, a, a navicula on the leatherback sea turtle. So at this point, you know, we had we had enough tersi coal species. We, we wanted to know, you know, how these guys are related to each other. Um, I'd say with the exception of those four species that, that Matt got DNA from single cells, we didn't have any DNA. So we just, we performed a, a morphological character analysis using uh, 30 different morphological characters. Ed Terrio ran the analysis for us. I wanna show you the results of that analysis. Here's the phylogeny. It was interesting, um, the tersi cola species, uh, they grouped into clades according to their host. So we got the uh, manatees, fresh, a freshwater turtle, cetaceans, and sea turtles in their own separate clades, suggesting that these guys uh, evolved separately on these different organisms, on these different host animals. And also, you may um, may see here, there's actually um, they, they group into the larger clades uh, by salinity. So with sea turtles and cetaceans in the open ocean being near normal salinity, and as freshwater turtle and manatee being in near shore areas, specifically in, in areas, back manatees, you know, go up into these freshwater areas to drink fresh water. So, uh, they grew by host clay by host animal, so possibly by, uh, by salinity. Another group that we found uh, to be prolific on these organisms um, were species of Proskinia. And uh, Proskinia was a relatively species poor genus uh, in, uh, in the marine, I, th I think also, also in, in some fresh waters. And we just about almost doubled the amount of species in that genus from the first one. And first they may ask you, what's, what's so special about Proskinia? Was there, is there any similarity with the, with the other episodes? Well, one similarity is, is uh, the presence of, of a really complex mortal, mortal bands. You know, the, this uh, pers uh, pers 20 plus girdle bands and the tersicola will, would have a dozen. Um, and those marine gophanemoids, uh, also Polinia, Kilonicola, also have a robust, very robust cingulum. And, you know, you speculate, you know, why, you know, why is that? What, you know, what's, what, does that, does that, does that give any advantage, you know, and, you know, we can, I'll let you think about that, you know, and maybe, maybe come back to that in the questions, because I got a few ideas. Look at the uh, um, phylogeny of this proskinia, and we find that it's a, it's a, it's, it's sister to fistulifera. And in fact, uh, what, what, what they both have in common is, is a synapomorphia, I'm going to show next, next, uh, the, the fistula, which is a, a poor like structure. Uh, that you know connects to the outside through you know through the valve face into the valve interior, and both of these uh, both of these groups have it. Um, sister to that large to that to those two clades is a um, is a clade containing Storonaeus, and those uh, Tersiacolas are actually sister to a, a Storonaeus clade. Actually, suggesting that used it was used it had it right, you know, when, when he first described it, he he described it uh, as a Storonea. So he he picked up that similarity pretty quickly. This shows a picture of of one of those proskinias. This is Burgos striata showing the, the 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 fistula. This guy was actually on manatees, but also on sea turtles. So this is one of the few that are a uh, few species that are shared between between the episodic hosts, but most of them are. are are not shared. Most of, the, most of them are unique, at least in terms of the, when we're talking about ter the genus Tersiacola. All right, so let's go to some, you know, why, you know, why, why episodic diatoms, you know, are, you know, are, 
why 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 are these things not just another benthic diatom you know why are they actually different well these episodic diatoms present novel opportunities to investigate basic ecological principles such as island biogeography so we can think of these again these host animals as isolated isolated islands of hard substrate within a you know watery realm okay so there may be uh, a whole bunch of things going on there, right? A bunch of adaptive, uh, some of the adaptive radiation, some of the sp and species flocks. These may be related, you know, like just like Darwin's finches. So these all, all things, all these um, ecological principles, you know, are, are areas ripe for investigation on these on these animals. Again, getting back to some of that most basic question, and obviously this was this was a, a question of you know, hey, you know, are there or is, is an obligate episode diatom a real thing, a real distinction? Is it you know different from a regular benthic diatom? And then, uh, as I mentioned when I first first uh, when I first talked to Nicole, I said, Nah, this 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 is the same stuff that's on the benthos. We're gonna you know, we're, you know it's just another hard substrate. Well, Azari et al. 2020 published a, a, a great little paper uh, investigating that that question. They compared the carapace community on, uh, on sea turtles to that found on flotsam. And they found that they were distinct communities between the two of them, okay? Uh, in fact, only four out of 37 total species were shared, okay? And those four 37 were you know, not dominant species. The dominant species on the, uh, on the seagrass tur turtle carapaces uh, were Kilonicola and Polunia. Those were described by, by Roxana earlier. Again, you know, they appear to be obligately episodic, specifically on the shell, and uh, and the the uh, community on the flotsam was was different. So we you know a great great study demonstrating that these communities are unique. Uh, this um, later on we, we looked at uh, we compared the communities uh, between loggerhead turtles on the on the shell on the carapace and also uh, partly on the skin. Uh, from different regions of the world. These, this uh, is a um, ordination showing the results of the community analysis on carapace communities from Croatia, Greece, South Africa, and right here in Florida. And the, um, the ones in Croatia, Greece, South Africa uh, were more similar to each other. They contain this, this Nitsia, the small Nitsia species. And the ones from Florida were the hyalocedra. Again, and these again, we believe these are the hitchhiker taxa, not the obligately epizoic taxa, but stuff that they may pick up and you know grow in their in their regions. And these communities may be useful for telling the origin of sea turtles. So you may be able to track their movement by looking at the incidental taxa on them. So that's something that that's part that um, that may be interesting. I also, part of that study that they looked at the difference between the skin communities versus the carapace communities on the loggerheads, specifically from Greece, then, and that's the only one that had it at, at, at that time. Uh, and they found that the, the, the communities were different. Okay, and again, the uh, the skin communities had the Tercicola and that Medlinella, and then the the uh, the carapace communities had that Polinia and Kilonicola and stuff that attached by mucilage stalk. Um, again, distinct. Now, not only distinct uh, by animal, but also distinct within the animal, skin versus versus carapace. Again, pretty neat. And, and it was, what, what else also neat is that the, uh, the carapace communities were, were readily grown in culture. The skin communities are uh, more difficult to grow. So just recently, um, Jesse Huggins, who, who I know was on this call, she uh, she uh, saw some of some of this work, and she noticed on some of her sick gray whales that they the, the baleen had this orange discoloration, and she wondered whether this could be diatoms. So she sent me a, a little bit of a sample, and uh, at the time, I, I, I uh, for the second time I put my foot in my mouth. I, I said, "Hey, yeah, that's that's great. I'll be happy to take a look at the uh, the baleen." But you know, also, I, but I'm I'm really interested in the skin. Can, can you send me some skin samples? Because I suspect the stuff on the baleen is just going to be stuff that they're sucking up from the bottom or the plankton. You know, it's you know, you know, I'll take a look at it and you know see what's on it. But I, I don't know. I I don't have a don't have a whole lot of hope. I think this is going to be another another organism causing you know causing your problem. So you want to guess what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The um, uh, the skin samples were 
were a bust. They did, it didn't have, have little of anything other than incidental planktonic taxa on it. But the baleen taxa and the stuff on the baleen was, 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 was unique. Again, uh, low diversity, only a few species. And again, Tercicola shows up. And it's a, it's a, new, it's a, a, a different species. Uh, it's also really strange and unique, you know, like, um, like you know, two weeks ago, uh, um, Pat Cassell talked about rampant homoplasy. So here we have an amphoroid Tercicola with a real eccentric wraith. And it's even got a canopium. So, but it's got this, uh, it's got this, uh, you know, butterfly structure here that that uh, identifies it as a, as a tercicola. It's again very interesting. So, on top of that, in, in on a few of the other Bailey samples, also had an, had another diatom that was rather unique and very interesting. And this was this um, species of amphora shown over here. And normally, if I came across an amphora in a, um, uh, one of these epizoic samples, it was, you know, one Z or two Z, you know, maybe a high diversity but low low number of the actual of, of individuals. And honestly, most of the time, I do my best to ignore it. There are the halomphoras, especially, are notably difficult. But I couldn't ignore this one because this one was abundant. Okay, uh, and it was big. I mean, I, you know, some of these guys are, you know, uh, that's a 20 micron scale bar. So that's up to 50, 50 microns. So a big and abundant amphora that kind of, you know, goes against what we see where you get abundance of uh, amphoras usually not very abundant, onesies, onesies and twosies, a lot, of different, a lot of different species present. But this was just this guy and a lot of it. Guys, I'm just trying to advance the slide, so. I'll be slow internet connection. Okay, I think we advanced a lot of slides there. All right, so where you know what you know just from you know from 2013 or actually 2015 when we when we really got into this stuff, you know what what have we learned? You know, first of all, yeah, obligate epizoic algae are a real thing. They're not just benthic taxa that happen to be on another hard substrate. The, 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 obviously, there's something unique about the substrate, unique about this habitat that uh, allows the development of unique communities. Okay. There seems to be evidence for these um, species flocks, uh, possibly some adaptive radiation. We have no idea what the heck the niches are in these things, but we've got six different, six different species of Tercicola on the, just on the skin of, of manatees. Now, how do they divide up that resource? We don't know. That all awaits discovery. Again, there's a lot more diversity out there. We haven't even attempted to, 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 count, the, to count and identify the entire community. It's a whole lot of samples. Right now, we're just treading water trying to describe some of the things that are obviously new. And I want to take a look at my time, because if I have time, I'm going to talk about this. If not, I'm going to skip it. Oh, I got a little bit of time. Perfect. OK. So if you mentioned uh, back, back in that um, very first uh, spaghetti, spaghetti graph diagram showing the, showing the connections and, and the flow chart of how all this, all this developed, I, it said that uh, you know, we went to China. Well, I, that's a little bit of a fib. We, we, uh, we didn't go to China. We, we, didn't, we didn't examine any material from China, but um, one of our studies, one of, one of our papers um, was considered or was discussed before this, before the this, uh, Botanical Board of Nomenclature. And what, this, uh, what they were uh, concerned with was uh, how we designated paratypes in our samples. Before I get that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about those samples. So those samples, these were from turtles. I didn't sample them myself. A veterinarian collected them. Uh, he couldn't. He, his supervisor wouldn't give him permission to to you know, do some extra sampling, but he told me that he could he could send me uh, Q-tips, and these Q-tips that he had used to clean the skin area before they took a blood sample. 
And he said, hey, I, I can save these for you. And then, you, and then you can look at the diatoms on them. I said, okay, great. You do that. And if you could also get some, you know, get some Q-tip samples from the um, carapace. Well, you can imagine there's not a whole lot of material on a, on a Q-tip sample. And when we started looking at them, wow, there was a lot of new stuff in there. And we were making a lot of slides. We were, you know, we're describing things with a lot of, you know, slides to go to the different museums. And we were running out of material from, say, an individual turtle. So we used multiple turtles. We used multiple turtles, uh, you know, to, uh, in, our, in our description. So the question was, you know, what do we call those, those other samples that aren't the holotype, you know? And we figured because they were from different turtles, they should be called paratypes as opposed to an isotype, which by definition is a duplicate of the holotype. So we know this isn't a duplicate in, in, in our definition. Um, so, but you know, it wasn't just, us. you know, we also sent this out to, to, to a lot of the, uh, I know Marina Potapova, and we asked her, say, hey, you know, you know, what do you think this should be? She had some debate. David Williams, uh, you know, chimed in and he had some debate, you know, within our group, you know, we weren't sure to isotype or paratype, but we eventually settled on paratype. And then uh, that was considered before the uh, botanical board and we were overruled. So um, we were made a, uh, a bad example. Yeah, so they said, because the specimens were collected on the same date, at the same time, by the same collector, they comprise a single get single gathering, admixtures accepted. So it didn't matter what else is around it. And the author's citation, so a paratypes is correctable to isotypes. Okay. Okay. My 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 question is, okay, what happens if you get um you sample on a beach like like we have? We said we sampled a bunch of nesting females a bunch of times of sea turtles. The sea turtles on that beach were Two different species, okay, uh, loggerheads and greens, okay. And let's say we describe the species that we observed on both of them as a single species, but we made a mistake, or you know later on we found that the stuff on the that we thought was the same on the loggerheads was actually different, say genetically. So let's say it was a cryptic species. How would we go back and correct that? You know, if, if if all those all those samples, all those specimens were labeled as isotypes, they'd be the same. But if we labeled them as paratypes, we could go back and correct them. So you know, I, I think what the some of the problem is is we you know you have a, a the type locality of an epizoic diatom is is mobile. It's it's not it's not one location. It's you know it, obviously it goes where that host goes. So it's it, again it's just another example of a unique situation that these epizoic communities present. Coming forward. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I believe this is my internet connection. It was actually out this morning. There we go. Again, I just want to you know, thank Everybody, you know, especially all the animal capture teams, you know, some of these teams are huge. You can imagine, you know, trying to, to catch manatees. It takes a crew of about 50 individuals. I mean, you've got 20, 20 people just to lift that thing onto the beach. Then you've got all the veterinarians uh, and the people on the boats, the spotters, it, it, really a, a huge operation. And the sea turtles, you know, the boat time and, you know, it, 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 capturing those turtles. And, and Jesse, thank you for tuning in. That Jesse there on top of that gray whale. Uh, she sent me all those really cool samples from the gray whales. Uh, and, and again, all my, all my collaborators, you know, Matt, you know, Matt, he's really the brains behind the operation. And, uh, and the call for all the permissions. In fact, I just called her this past Sunday. We had a uh, we had a whale stranding here in Florida. I called her on Sunday morning at nine o'clock. I said, "Hey, can you get me permission to be on the beach?" You know, and she you know she made the stop. You know, we had the permits, uh, but unfortunately, that 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 whale was already cut up and buried by the time you know by the time we were available. So I'm gonna leave that to questions from you all. I hope you enjoyed it and found it uh, you know found it interesting and worth your time. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was definitely enjoyable. Um, thank you for taking us on that really fun and exciting odyssey. It really was an odyssey. It must have been yeah. really exciting for you to be called to these animals and um, to sample them. It's really cool. 
So um, we have a few questions here. Um, Anna asks, I can imagine why marine fauna can grow unique diatoms, but what makes freshwater turtles a unique substrate? And how did Tercia cola make its way to a freshwater turtle? All right, okay, okay, yeah, that's an excellent question. Okay, um, first I tell you, you know, some people have looked at, at, at turtle, freshwater turtles, not a, not a whole lot. I think the last I looked, I think there was like 200 species of freshwater turtles. And then I think out of that, you know, maybe four or five were looked at for epizoic diatoms. But the, and, and they haven't found, haven't found, found uh, epizoic diatoms. But the reason I think that is, with the exception of this one turtle, and I'm gonna get to that in a little bit, is because these pond turtles are not isolated enough. So they, they have, a, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty much in contact with the bottom or pretty close to it quite often. So as opposed to these oceanic turtles who are, you know, can be, you know, way out there, you know, in the sargassum beds in the sargasso sea, you know, and the, and the closest bottom is, you know, 2000 feet down. So I, I think it has to do with isolation. Okay. So why, you know, what, what about that one freshwater turtle is a podoc, uh, 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 was it Podoc Nemecola, Tercicola Podoc Nemecola, and that was the one described by Carlos Wetzel and Bart Van de Viver and Luke Ector. This was from the uh, the Amazon rainforest. There's there, there's a similarity between that freshwater turtle and the sea turtle. That freshwater turtle is also a colonial nester and nests on beaches, and it nests on uh, these beaches uh, on sandbars in the rivers. I don't know how it's related, but it, you know, it, but but it just stands out, stands out as a similarity and something that you know I you every you know somebody who wants to think about you know why that is okay where where do they come from they, actually you know they, they speculated on that and the Amazon has a river dolphin and they speculate well maybe it came from this river dolphin in the in the Amazon yeah I don't know. You know, but you know what's also interesting about um, about sea turtles and how they differ uh, with relation to the uh, cetaceans and the manatees uh, in terms of di uh, the episodic diatoms is that you know these the young you know, develop from eggs and they are far removed from mom and dad for the first big portion of their lives. Okay, so if these diatoms truly are obligately epizoic, those early life stages should lack these, lack these diatoms. And they'll only be picked up later on when they have picked up, picked the stuff up either through mom and dad or another, another adult. You know, that opposed to whales and manatees, which they give birth, give birth to a calf, calf gets it from mom. Calf gets inoculated with this epizoic, epizoic community from mom. And in fact, th th that's what we see. Uh, uh, we sample young ones. They, they do not have these episodic communities. It's only uh, later on the adults that, that we find them. In fact, I just learned that again. I just had to sample um, some uh, turtle diatoms for DNA, and I sampled juveniles because it was easier for the staff to get those than to wrestle a 300-pound turtle. And when I got back, you know what? I, I should have known better, but there was absolutely no episodic di diatoms on them. So I went back, I got two adults, and wow, I mean, it was just, you know, by the bazillion. Um, and that's a real term. Uh, so, yeah, again, you know, very, you know, very, uh, very interesting. An, an excellent question. Thank you. Um, I was curious, are the diatoms attaching directly to the manatee skin with like mucilage? Or did you also see like epiphytes on that red alga that you talked about? Yeah, um, I, I looked at the stuff on the red algae, and uh, and um, w even without the red algae, uh, these diatoms were there. Uh, Roxana Majeska's got some phenomenal images. She's got some in situ images that she, uh, you know, critically point dried, and she shows some of the natural orientation of, of these. And they, you know, there's a big mucilage mat. In fact, you can partly see that. You know, when I had that image of the uh, of the manatee with the penny. And you can see there's, there's, there's there is like a, a mucilage film over there, it, and of course it has no color because there's no there's 
those diatoms, you know, are, are apochlorotic. apochlorotic. Uh, but yeah, you look at that, and there there is a mucilage, and the stuff on the carapace, the Polinia culinicola, said it has a mucilage stalk. It, it comes off there. Um, those are the guys that are attached to the shell. Once the epizoal community develops, where it gets all this other stuff on it, you get a lot more incidentals, and that other stuff kind of gets drowned out. You don't see a lot of it because the the episode film or you know gets quite big you know did i answer that yeah um okay so interesting you mentioned um the apochlorotic um the diatoms without chloroplasts um how do they get their nutrients and energy well we we we, we, we well we, it's got to come from uh you know fixed organic matter already right so you know it's osmotrophic you know we we don't see these guys opening up and engulfing things. <laughs> uh, we assume it's, you know, it, it's, it's either from, you know, the community that develops on the skin, maybe something exuded from the skin, maybe something that, that results from the decomposition of the, of the skin. Um, we don't know. In fact, you know, we, we think whatever it is, it, it's probably what keeps us from being successful in our attempts to culture these. You know, we've tried some heterotrophic media and not been successful. Uh, we've got a few more things to try. Um, we don't know, but yeah, I mean, I, that, that's, that's a, that's a, that's another, you know, big, you know, big important question that needs to be answered. There's a question here from Mark. Um... He recalls a recent paper where diatoms were described from freshwater dolphins in the Amazon. Were those also in their own genus or related to these other marine epibionts? I think that was that was that was in the uh, the uh, Carlos Wetzel paper that that described the the Tercicola podoc nemocola, but I'm I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. A lot of this, you know, there's there there are other taxa that are that are so far only found on, on the whales and cetaceans, and these are the you know cochineid types, uh, Benetella and uh, Epipelis. And also they 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 have a, they seem to have a um, you know some other adaptations, you know, some of these really strong reinforcements to the valve. You know, maybe that has to do with these animals, you know, diving to, to great depths. I mean, maybe that's why you have this. Uh, butterfly structure on Tercicola. Maybe that's why you have pseudoscepta and and septa, and may, you know maybe even for the, you know the, the the large cingulum. You know as opposed to being rigid, maybe it's flexible. Maybe it it it, it can flex on different cha different changes. Thing. You know, I as far as I know, no one's ever never seen or, or recorded you know the the cingulum compressing and contracting like an accordion. So you know maybe if we could uh, you know put these in some type of pressure chamber and actually get a camera in there. You know, we, we might see something. Um, earlier, you kind of teased us, and sorry if I missed it. Um, you were talking about that one diatom with multiple girdle bands. Um, okay. Yeah, why, why yeah. is that advantageous for that diatom? Uh, yeah, I, I, again, again, I'm just speculating. First of all, you know, the, the multiple girdle bands didn't evolve on this special habitat, this is on many other many other genera outside the epizoic environment, um, but it, it is kind of you know you know coincidence you know strange that we we have a large proportion of the of the obligately epizoic tax to have these complex girdle bands. And again, you know, again, if you forgive me for speculating, I'm thinking, you know, maybe this has to do with the you know the constant and uh, constantly changing pressure environment. And you know, as opposed to you know strict stuff that keeps things from breaking, maybe this is the opposite strategy. You know, maybe a, a flexible that, that can allow that thing to move in and out, maybe a little bit like an accordion to keep the uh, to keep the cell intact. Again, just speculation, but you know, definitely worthy of of investigation if somebody can figure out how to do that. There is a question here from Maria, um, and I think. It, it'll go back to a story you were telling us before we started the recording of the webinar. Um, her question is, have you ever sampled in aquariums? Yeah, uh, yes, 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 I have. Uh, and, and actually the most important, um, uh, Roxana Majeska sampled in, in an aquarium in, in, uh, in Poland. And in that aquarium, they have captive manatees and they've had them there for, I don't know, many, many years. Um, and that 
epizoic community is there. It, it, it's still there, specifically uh, Tersicola zimania, I think was the dominant one she, that she found on those ones, and it may be the only one. Uh, but it, that's, that's pretty interesting because it's completely fresh water, many years, and our manatees were sampled out in the, many of our manatees were sampled out in the salt. So obviously that, that, that's, that's kind of rare for a lot of diatoms being able to tolerate full strength seawater to full strength freshwater. That's, that's, a, that's quite an adaptation and quite rare among the, among the diatoms. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, Mark asks another question, have Tersiacola been found only as epibionts or have they shown up elsewhere now that we recognize them? Okay, the only place they have showed up other than on the, on the skin of animals, of these animals, is below um, a large dock over in Japan. Well, that large dock and over in Japan is where they brought the whales and, and they, they, uh, they flensed them and they, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's where they butchered the whales. So that's where they found them. I, they were found in the sediments. They were, uh, they were not found alive. They were just, you know, just sales. And they were, I think it's pretty obvious they resulted, you know, from the dead carcasses being, you know, decomposed in that area. But all we may mention one one thing about that. Yeah, I, I've done a lot of searching for stuff like this, and I I found a picture of one valve of Polinia. So Polinia was one of the one of the genera described by Roxana. This was one that grows on the carapace of sea turtles. I saw one external view of possible valve uh, that was found as an epiphyte on Clodophora over in Sweden that was in Matt's uh, Kuhlensterner's thesis uh, dissertation. And he has a description and the description also matches it, uh, but we can't fully confirm it because I think we really have to see uh, if it has a, a septa or pseudo septa, where those things are, where those, uh, you know, confirm that with a photograph. Uh, Cause again, he, all he had was an external photograph and there's a lot of stuff that looks like that, you know, specifically Gumpaniumopsis. Um, there's a follow-up from Mark. Um, have all Tersiocola been shown to be without chloroplasts? No, no. The uh, the 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 Tersiocola on the, on the sea turtles are are um, are photosynthetic. Yeah, yeah, and we, we we've got some of them in culture. A uh, question from Layla: uh, What is the species name of your amphora that was abundant and big? And was it specific to one host and specific area? Okay, uh, like I said, you know that's that, that that's brand new stuff. They, these are from gray whale baleen. Uh, we have we have since got a lot of skin samples and a lot more baleen. We, we found it we found it again only on the baleen, not not on the skin. Uh, it is it is new, uh, and I, I I can I can say that we gave that to you know, sent it off to Josh to panic and asked Josh to. Uh, now, if he would uh, <laughs> confirm that and also, you know, also help us with the description if, if it was new. Um, and it, one reason it didn't it didn't belong to the you know, Hallam 4, it belonged to the Oxium 4 group, which is which is a much smaller group. So, we, you know, we could narrow it down a lot easier. Um, yeah, and he said it, it is unique, so it, it's new. That doesn't have a name yet. Cool. Let's see, I don't see any new questions. Um, but we're getting right up to the top of the hour. Um, I just found it um, kind of funny and interesting that you have uh, type localities of these species that are not in one place. <laughs> they move around. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. As, as I said, like I said, I you know I don't think the code was was ready for for, for epizoic diatoms. You know, and and I was a little disappointed that you know obviously they considered that issue before them, but they, they never consulted, you know, somebody else presented that, that, that stuff to them, uh, but we were never consulted or asked, you know, hey, you know, why did we, why did we do that? Um, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I thought we might've been able to add a little bit more to the discussion, you know? Um, again, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's not straightforward and, and of course it can't be, you know, you've got to, <laughs> You, you know, you got vascular plants tied in with tied in with diatoms, and now we throw throw in this wrench about epizoic diatoms. Yeah, 
Maybe it's a future opinion piece. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, we, we, it just honestly it just taught me. Said, hey, now again, you know, when you collect, collect in abundance because you know you're you never know how much material you're going to need. And again, it was a special situation. Those um, those turtles, you know, they were sampled with Q-tips. Those Q-tips didn't have a whole lot of material on them, so that that, that material was readily used up. We don't we don't use Q-tips anymore. We use uh, toothbrushes. We get a lot more material. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, thanks for answering all these questions. It's been really interesting and fun. Great to have you on here. Um, any last words for us? Oh boy, you know what? You know, if anybody's interested, you know, I, I do have plenty of material. If anybody would just like to some material for their own use to look at or whatnot, I'm happy to happy to send stuff out. Also, you know, I'm I'm down here in South Florida. If any of you, you know working with you know whatever diatom you're working with and you think it you know it may be found down here if i could send you some stuff i'd be happy to you know um, um and, and of course you know you can email me with any requests for any literature it, the literature's actually gotten quite big on this on this topic you know qu quite quickly yeah um, awesome well, I want to thank all the participants for joining us today. Um, we'll see you again on our next Web Academy, which is on Tuesday, May the 11th. Uh, our speaker will be Paul Hamilton from the Canadian Museum of Nature, and he will be telling us about the genus Nedium. So thank right. you. Awesome. Care. See you next time. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Nice seeing you all. Thanks, Tom. That was great. Thank you. My favorite part was there's a dead manatee. Let me get my toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs>